Hi guys, welcome back to the Sanderson Chronicles. I'm your host Maureen and we're joined again today with Janice. Hi. And we are talking a recap of episode six, which happens to be Janice's favorite. And yes. I think one of my favorites and most of the fandom's favorite episode, I think, is episode six. Yeah. I had to rewatch it today because every time I tried to think about what I was going to say about episode six, I kept just focusing, like hyper-focusing on Sydney and Charlotte. Like, uh-huh. I know that more things happen in this particular episode. Right, right. But they were, there was more of them than anyone else in this episode. Yes. And I mean, that dance, those words, I, I mean, it finally happened. So, I mean, that's, that's the biggest part of it. Yep, that's yeah. right. So when it first opens, Charlotte finally arrives in London. Right. And I, and like I love her- the way... I love the way she gets off the coach and her first words, well, other than trying to get somebody to tell her where this address is, is courage, Charlotte. <laughs> yeah. And I love her amazing foresight of, oh, by the way, can you tell me how to get to this place? Yeah. So like everyone who walks by. Right. And maybe you were like me, the, well, the first time that I watched it, the pandemic had started you know mm-hmm. everything wasn't completely shut down but it had started well probably it was by the time the sixth episode was broadcast and yeah because it premiered january of 2020 i thought it was february but yeah one of the yeah but anyway by the time you get to the sixth you're into february or march somewhere in there mm-hmm. and the um and i was just struck by watching it the first time when she's walking in that street in London and all those people are coughing and sneezing and throwing up and, you know, I'm Mm -hmm. like, Oh my gosh, it made it even more uh, poignant because of what we were going through at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, those conditions were just, every time I watch it, like, I know, I know know that it wasn't clean back in that time period because it couldn't be as clean as we keep things today. So every time that there's a movie or a video or something like that, where they walk through the slums, even in Pride and Prejudice, when they find Lydia with Wickham in the slums of London, it just grosses me out. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it wasn't exactly life in general. Wasn't that clean anyway, but yeah, Mm -hmm. even more so. Yeah, exactly. And like, they did a really good job, even with the background characters that there was one guy when she I don't know if she I can't remember if she was asking him directions but he like looked at her for a second and almost leered at her and then he was like mm, wait <laughs> and then he turned back around and he didn't have any speaking parts but he looked like really grisly really scary they did a really good job with all their background makeup and costuming and just a really yeah. good job in this episode all around they had to do so many different aspects of that life in that period Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And making it look like a London street, Mm -hmm. you know, which obviously it wasn't really, you know. Yeah. Did they film that in, in Brighton or, um, they, they filmed it. I'm not remembering right now, but at this estate where they did some filming of the interiors, I believe, but I finally saw a picture of it, the outside. And I went, that's where they filmed London. (laughs) <laughs> but I ever, but um, the London Street. But I'm sorry, right now I can't think of which which estate it was. I'll have to look it up and then put it in the podcast yeah, description because the, that's interesting to know. Yeah, and the, um, uh, the obviously they used a green screen for <laughs> the scenes on the water. You know where she's walking along the wharf. Oh yeah, yeah. That was clearly a green screen, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it was very convincing what they did. Yeah. And I actually, I actually like Sam Sidaway's character. I like what they did with him. And I like that they kind of like, they made him a a respectable guy, even though he lived in the slums, even though he was black man, they made him a respectable guy. And I appreciate that they kept doing that in different aspects of the show. I mean, yeah, he didn't have a lot of money. Most honestly, most black people back then didn't because they weren't given an opportunity or a chance, but he still threw that guy out of his establishment. He told her she shouldn't be down there. He, he didn't offer freebies to anybody. He cautioned her against coming in for a drink. Like he, he was well, actually, yeah. And it, actually he said, I think he said, you can come in for a drink if you want, cause he wanted to get her away from the riffraff out there. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, he was uh, 
business owner. Yeah. So he was definitely more respectable than yeah. he said, this isn't a, isn't a pleasure garden, you know, mm-hmm. so it wasn't, it wasn't a whorehouse. Yeah. So. And he was cautioning her from even being in that area. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> what, are, what are you doing? And so I, and I like that he, he wasn't, um, she asked him questions and he still answered them and he was under no, no obligation to do that either. Right. Yeah, that's right. It was it was good and it was an important scene because of the information she gathered mm-hmm. you know and then that man that she ran into and she was trying to leave on that very narrow alleyway you know any excuse to get sydney parker to fight for the woman he loves is good for me <laughs> <laughs> did you see the interview with him where he talked about the fact that they originally had him coming in and you see him more as he attacks the man who was attacking her, but they said it made him look too much like a superhero or something. And so that's when they cut it a little differently, you know, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> He's our superhero. He is. And it actually, the way his stance was, because I saw him in the Divergent franchise first. Right, me so too. When he, after he beat him up, he has this stance when he's, like fighting on screen I don't know what it is but like his feet get really wide and he just gets really still like he plants his feet for a minute and then he sways and so it was just but it was that scene on the rocks in Divergent when he beat the crap out of those boys right and yeah that's right that was real right there yeah 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 Yeah. but anyway but I do love that see I love both of their bewilderment of of all the places that I could possibly run into, it's in the slums of London. And right. I don't even think he, one, I don't think he thought she had the courage to go there, but I don't think he thought that she had the knowledge enough to go there either. And she also thought he didn't have the address. And, mm-hmm. Which know, he coach. didn't when he left. But he found it. Mm-hmm. And that's what he says. And I liked, I like that, um, their conversation of, how could you possibly help me? Why didn't think you had this address? I don't need protecting. And then that guy bumps into them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Sydney grabs him by the shoulder, throws him to the ground and says, excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> no, that, that was so funny to me, but that's so funny that he's yeah. so, he puts that little bit of sarcasm in there and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a great amount of admiration because he's annoyed with her for showing up right. there because it adds another burden of, oh, I had to protect you. Obviously you can't be trusted in the first place because you started all this emotion. Now I have to protect you. So I'm already mad. Right. And then when she says, when he makes the comment about, I can't believe Mary let you come. And she says, she doesn't know I came here. In fact, she expressly forbade it. Right. Look at his face as he stops and looks at her. He's got almost like a smirk. Yeah. And so the fact that she defied Mary to go there to help in this situation endeared her to him even more. Oh, I agree. Yes. And he, you know, he could see that she had a lot more courage than he thought. I mean, this is a part of him underestimating her, Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. And she's determined to try and do something. And he's like, you know, you've done enough already. Yeah. And um, yeah, he wants to take her to Tom and get, get her out of his way. Mm Mm-hmm. And honestly, I think part of it too is that, I mean, we all know by this point he's in love with her based off of episode three and his, his fury at the things that she said to him in episode four and based off of all the stares in episode five, we know that he's well on his way to being in love with her, even if he doesn't know yet himself. Right. So I think yeah. part of him trying, wanting to hide her away at Tom's and keep her out of this is to keep her safe. It's not just oh, like, uh, yeah. oh, I don't want to protect you, but... I don't think he would handle it well if something happened to Charlotte either. Oh, absolutely. That's the case. And when, you know, he says mercifully, Tom's in London, you know, so he is, yeah, absolutely. That's a big concern. Mm -hmm. I I don't think he, it really has dawned on him how much, what he feels for her yet. No. In the same way that she does, hasn't figured it out really. I think he's more aware though than she is because he actually well, works had... to hide it. No, and that's right. See that in all those in episodes three, four, and five. You can see he actively works to hide his feelings for her. He just can't do it very well. So that's what he keeps. I mean, that's why in episode five, he went to Mrs. Griffith and said, I'm never coming back here. 
because he knew right. that he was in danger of being really, really in love with this woman. And so he, I think he, he was he's more trying to it. stop it, right? Mm-hmm. That's what he's yeah. trying to do. He's gonna he's trying to nip it in the bud, is it were. Yeah. But yeah. And then he accuses her of, you know, you yeah. can't help. How could you possibly help? And then they're in the carriage and she obviously is fighting to stay, fighting to help, fighting to, no, just let me come. We're wasting time. And then he says uh, something about being in the city of a million people. Mm-hmm. How will we find him? And she says, the sons of Africa. And right. Look at that. She just helped you. She just gave you information you didn't know. Right. That's right. And because of the time she'd spent with him, mm-hmm. that's why she had that knowledge. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. And that's another scene where I really, really like Sydney because it's when he is protecting someone, he is very, very fierce. And he is a very big force to be reckoned with when he is fighting for someone that he cares about or that he feels responsible for. Right. And so when they go in the Sons of Anarchy, not Anarchy, Sons of Africa, <laughs> and um, they are listening to, they actually listen to Otis talk for a bit before he interrupts him. And he has no cares that he is in front of a group of people. He just calls them out right there. Right and again. He, go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's Charlotte's level head again that gets them to the point that they need to be to find out where Georgiana is. Right. Yeah. And that room that they shoot that in, I was so fascinated with it, mm-hmm. you know, where that take pla- takes place. And I think I ask the director when they were doing that Q and A for episode six mm-hmm. and um, Lisa, what's her last name? Clark. Clark. Um, and they shot it at, or somebody told me they, they shot it at the John Wesley room and, and it's a church where one of, you know, who John Wesley is mm-hmm. um, in Bristol. Okay. But I thought, wow, what great um, location scouting because it's just such an unusual room. Yeah. You know, I'd love to visit it. If I, if I get it, if I really get to go over there, I'm definitely going to make a point of going to see it. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like there's a lot of churches and courthouses look like that in that time period. Isn't, would that be accurate? Cause I feel like there's, yeah. whenever I've seen things like that. They've had rooms like that, but it is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they had to, in order for the preacher or the speaker to project his voice they didn't have microphones and Mm -hmm. so they had to be up a little bit higher yeah so that they could see everybody but also so that their voices would carry yeah and uh so that's part of the reason and of course his voice really carries when he's talking to those guys Mm -hmm. but how impassioned was his speech too by the way oh it was really good and Mm -hmm. in fact somebody wrote in one of the twitter things that i read and was just upset that he was interrupted, <laughs> that Sydney interrupted him, you know, like it was a racial thing that he interrupted him. It had yeah. nothing to do with that. No. But yeah, it was because he's concerned about this person he's supposed to be protecting. And he holds all this personally responsible. He does. Yeah. Which even before accurate. he understands why. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the other thing I noticed too about that scene is that when you look out in the crowd of who's listening to Otis, it's not just black men and women. No. And it's also not just men. <laughs> there's right. a mix of women and children and men, but there's also a mix of races. There are some yeah. who um, look to be more from like Philippine or Mexico. And there's white people in the audience who are all listening to this impassioned speech with like, yes, this is what we want to do. And I thought that was a really neat, I, I, I don't know how, how accurate that is but i like to think it would be at least somewhat accurate that there would be that mix of people even even if it was just one or two whites and at a gathering like this at that time period um there were a lot of whites involved in anti the anti-slavery mer- movement a lot in britain um i i don't know about britain in particular but i feel pretty strongly there was there certainly was in the u.s I think it's, for me, it's that time period. I'm, I'm wondering about that time period. I know that as, as it got on, there was more, but there was a lot of whites who were very invested in the slave trade. So it's, and especially for like a smaller country like Britain. Yeah. I was curious right. if that demographic the, was actually accurate. I would like to think it is. Well, the religious, like the Quakers who were certainly around yeah, then true. were very anti-slavery. And um, 
yeah, I mean, I don't know about large numbers. I'm sure it was still, it was growing, but the slave trade was outlawed, outlawed in England long before it was in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I did look up and, uh, you know, the Sons of Africa was a real movement yeah. mm -hmm. at the time. So. And I like, I think that I, at first I just assumed, but I did look it up um, just to be sure. But I know that Andrew Davies is careful to not put like things like that in there that weren't actually a thing or existed later. He tries to be more consistent with, and of course he's not the only writer involved in this either. Right. And this particular episode was um, Justin Young, mm -hmm. but the, of course it was, they had, right. They had um, historians besides um, uh, our friend, whose name escaped Paula. me all of a sudden, besides Paula. Paula involved. was the literally literary supervisor. Yep, she was the Jane Austen, right. you know, but they did have a historical um, supervisor. Yeah, and I well. believe that historical supervisor uh, it was where is working on Bridgerton. Mm, no, I didn't realize that, I don't think. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the same woman. But anyway... Not that it matters here and now. <laughs> I just remember following up to see, you know, about that. So, you know me, I'm always looking at those little things. Yes. I, I mean, I think that's good to know, though. I think that when you're watching a show that is set in history, I think it's a good idea to know these things because it kind of makes it more, makes it more tangible. Right. More relatable. Yeah. Instead, instead of just a piece of fiction. Mm hmm. All right. So I'm looking up the cast. Okay, so we're finishing up um, this episode, I mean, this scene, and now they go back to the carriage. Of course, Sydney takes- But first, I'd like oh, to talk yeah. about what they talk about there. Oh, sure, yeah, of course, yeah, the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Hannah Gregg, by the way, is the historical advisor. Okay. Um, but in that scene where they're talking to Otis, she watches it for a while. Charlotte just kind of watches Sydney attack and and mm -hmm. Otis Perry. And that's just, that's just what they're doing back and forth while she watches. She lets them say what they need to say. And then she physically puts her body in the way. And I think that's important. The way she interrupts Sydney, she doesn't just start talking. She doesn't put her, she actually kind of puts herself in, the, in his line of vision. She doesn't stand directly between them, but she does get herself in his line of vision and then starts talking at that moment in time. Like she understood that Sydney has to see me and hear me to stop because I think she could kind of tell that there was a connection that she understood him and he understood it and trusted her a little bit. Right. And, and certainly she is between them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, sort of a triangle, but she's mm -hmm. definitely between them. And um, she's the one who says, why would somebody want to take, pick up your post if he's, because mm -hmm. he's list, she's listening to the fact that Otis is saying he didn't ever get it. Yeah. And Sydney's not believing him. And she's, so she's, she's thinking more logically in this whole segment of uh, scenes. Well, it's because she Sydney trusts, Char she trusts Otis and Sydney doesn't. Right. That's right. She believes Otis is a good man. And Sydney thinks there's nothing redeeming about him. Right. Right. And so he's, he's hearing him say, I didn't receive it. And he says, don't lie to me. Like, right. It How just can coincidence this have happened, that she then? was taken from the exact place that she designed to meet with you. Right. So he doesn't think that he has any redeeming qualities whatsoever. He thinks that he's a rake. He's, he, I don't know how much of Otis's issues he understands, but he certainly is clear when he says it was Beecroft who has his notes. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's right. And so what else do you want to say about that conversation? Anything? There was, I just wanted to point out that he needed, Charlotte understood how to stop Sydney and it worked because Sydney let her talk without interruption and watched her and him as Charlotte had watched him and Otis before that. Right, right. And then he grabs Otis and says, come with me. And mm. we don't see them in the carriage together at that point, but we know they've taken the carriage yeah. because then they show up, the two men are go into um, Beecroft's office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just the scene right before that, I believe they cut to the denims. That could be, I, yeah, yeah I don't remember the exact. I think that's why we don't see them in the carriage because they cut to Lady Denim in her deathbed. Oh, probably. And yeah. Esther's still in the clothes that she found that, you know, when, when Annie Reed, when Lady Denim got sick, she passed out. Esther's still in the same clothes from the night before. 
Right. And Clara is methodically wringing out that water, the ray with water on it. And you could just right. tell that the wheels in her head are spinning of how she's going to use this, what she's going to do. And Edward is just Edward. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of <laughs> conniving. And he's, although we're sure you won't need it, Aunt. Is there a priest or perhaps a solicitor we can get right. for you? And the yeah. look on Esther's face, even she is just aghast at that. Like, oh, yeah. She's like, like no very decency whatsoever. Right. Yeah, that's right. She she is appalled at his approach to things. He's because it's clear to her that she's being he is only concerned about her fortune and nothing else. Yeah. And yeah. I think that makes it clear that if the situation was reversed and Edward was there when Lady Denham passed out, there's no way that she would have been helped or taken care of or anything. Yeah. Edward would have run to find the will while she slowly died on her own. Let me help. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so I think, and especially, I think it was glaringly obvious too, after she just had to turn down Babington mm -hmm. because she spent that afternoon with Babington. He made her laugh. He actually cared for her as a human being. He was a decent man. And I think the further removed she was from him. And I think she hated saying no to him in the first place. And we talked about this in the last recap. I think right. she hated saying no to him. So to see that Edward has almost no decency whatsoever after she just turned on a man with decency for no reason other than she felt she had to be with Edward. Right. It's just making her more and more sick to her stomach. He, because he manipulated her yet again. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why she turned down Babington. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a heartbreaking scene. Ugh. I hate it. But I do <laughs> like seeing her discover what is wrong with you to him. I, I like that I we're seeing her see things in a different light in edward than she because i'm sure that edward hasn't really changed no <laughs> pretty no, sure quite the opposite she just notices it now because right. she had babington as the example right yeah she has this contrast to see mm -hmm. yeah the way he treats her versus how edward treats her and even then after he said this about the solicitor he gives her this look like this is our chance you know mm -hmm. And I agree. She's kind of appalled by it. Yeah. And anyway, so well, I was um, going to tell you one other thing um, in, in the book. The thing that's good about the book is it adds some perspective and, you know, sort of sort of gives you some idea about what some of the characters were thinking and doing, because, of course, books do that. Right. They mm -hmm. explain things, whereas in film, all you can go is by the conversation and how you see them act yeah. but um yeah at one point when edward is talking with clara clara says i think um we need to not say anything this is later on about the will we need to not say anything to esther because she has a conscience mm. yeah interesting huh yeah. I'm not surprised that Clara picked up on that. No, but we didn't have it voiced, you know. Yeah. And I want to make this observation between the book and the series, the television series. There are, I'd say if anything and I'm sure this was a necessity of time, there was editing. The main um, conversation, the main dialogue is the same. I mean there's but there's scenes that are left out of the movie um that are in the book. And there's times when it's been edited down, you know, the there's some pieces of the conversation that have been removed that aren't in the film. It'd be interesting to know how much of that they filmed and then cut and how much mm -hmm. of it we cut from the beginning. But 99% of the time, I think that um, the film is better. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. where they cut the conversation was better. The changes they made were better. Yeah. But of course, this wasn't a final draft, you know, the that's true. The book yeah. wasn't based on a final draft of the script. Mm -hmm. I still need to get that book. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when we get to episode eight, you will have gotten it. Huh? <laughs> Maybe by that time. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just teasing. No, I really I, I hope to, but I guarantee you I'm just gonna keep saying every time I talk to you, oh Janice, I need that book every time I talk to you. Yeah, I'm gonna give you some insight from this chapter. 
this i mean this episode a little bit further along okay so when they're in the when they're in that room with lady denim and she's saying all these things of how um she already has her solicitor and it's that's what edward gives esther that look yes is when she says no i have no need for a clergyman and i i have no need for a solicitor he very well knows where my will is hidden and then that's when edward is there's almost like a a maliciousness to the way he looks at esther there oh yeah he just like now he's gonna find it mm -hmm. there's a very slow turn of his head towards esther and he even nods towards lady denim like see Mm -hmm. see (laughs) i don't know that was just it's very uh it's evil yeah yeah and he has he's so proud of himself for getting that information out of her Mm -hmm. and i just jack fox does it so well but usually he's just a lovable cat and this is the first episode where it's like Oh, you kind of, you, you're really, actually it starts in episode five when he kisses Esther and then gives that gross smirk over her shoulder. But right, he, this is where he starts to go into no-no territory. Right. <laughs> he's no longer a lovable cat anymore. He's, he's actually a villain now. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So then it's after this that we jump into the, um, the scene. Well, actually, do we, does Clara, I don't remember. I don't think Clara gives a look. I think she listens quietly she kind of blends into the background there while she lets edward do get her to do all the talking yeah because edward's yeah, probably she's... clara's probably been in the house looking for the will since she moved in huh, maybe she uh, she has she's been fussing over mm-hmm. um lady denim you know <laughs> she gets upset about mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> she's like i have the milk from my asses how does right. donkey milk <laughs> free you from sickness her mind is so it's so odd well and the seawater you know the seawater is her other cure Mm -hmm. which i kind of get that the salt does you know can help clean you out but it's still i don't know about your stomach it works for (laughs) other parts of your body but anyway so then we go from this scene into b croft and we see Theo, not Theo, Sydney and Otis and Beecroft all in there. And Mm -hmm. Theo does some great nonverbal in this scene too. I mean, he's really, really, his skill set is really excels in nonverbal, but this scene he does it really, really well. And I I like that Otis is trying to say the whole time that no, I've of course I've never, I've never. And as Beecroft is telling Sydney this, Sydney just stares at Otis out of the corner of his eye. (laughs) Yeah would just he just gets more and more disgusted as the story goes on because as far as he's concerned what is ha- being said just confirms all the things he's thought about otis yep. you know that he really that he really is after her money that's all yeah and there's no way that otis can defend what he said and make it appear as if well i did need her money but i also love her like those two things can't coincide for sydney Right. And he saw it as Otis saw it as a delaying tactic Mm -hmm. about paying his thing. But um, Sydney sees it as much more devious and Mm -hmm. wrong. Yeah. I said, that's what he's actually going to do. And he probably would have done that. But I think that he would have discussed it with Georgiana before he did it. Yeah, one hopes. Um, Fortunately, Sydney was standing in the way of that happening I, I, yeah did you say fortunately or unfortunately fortunately sydney yes. was standing <laughs> as her guardian it may, uh, although he may not have been a great guardian in many ways he was trying to protect her and mm-hmm. her fortune and that makes me sad too when he in this episode how georgiana treats him after he rescues her i mean we'll talk about that when we get to it but i just uh, i just wanted to see it yeah and so obviously Sydney finds out where B. Croft, well, not where she is, but who B. Croft has sold her to. And again, it is Charlotte who figures out what the next move should be because Sydney is so angry. He's so frustrated. And I think he kind of retreats into that self-deprecation so much. He's like, all right, we're done. We're screwed. We, we lost. I'm giving up. Right. And that's after the scene where she gets so mad at Otis. I mean, it's all the same scene, but a few yep. seconds after he gets so mad at off Otis and 
when he suggests, which was a stupid thing to say, if you'd only <laughs> allowed us to marry. Oh, right. Yeah. Then he'd, she'd be in a different kettle of fish. That's all. And if you would only allow me to take all of her money, then I wouldn't have owed this man money. Like, and, and right. And she wouldn't have been kidnapped <laughs> by another man who just wanted her money. You know, it was not a good insight. And fortunately for him, Charlotte steps in the way and stops it from getting any worse. And that's, again, the, the reason I pointed out the scene earlier where Charlotte knew to get her physically in, in his eyesight with hearing him or hearing her, she does this again. When he has him up against the wall, Charlotte right. puts her head right next to Otis's face and says, stop, right. what good will it do? And Theos, Sydney, <laughs> stops and stares right at Charlotte. He yeah. stares at her for a good solid, I don't know, 20 seconds. And then he looks back at Otis and he gives up. He listens to her. And he, she gets, I mean, she gets him to get out of this emotional anger moment and to try and use the logical part of her, his brain. Yeah. And that's also after he dismisses Otis, that's what she does again is she says, he doesn't seem like the kind of man who would um, give her up without payment. And all mm -hmm. he said is he's had a promise of payment. And that once again, gets Sydney to think about where she could possibly be yeah. in London. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's a funny role reversal because the whole reason that they are in this mess where the uh, Georgiana's correspondence has been delivered to Otis, well, not really delivered, but sent out is because Charlotte was acting, reacting emotionally to Sydney. Right. That's and right. then this happened. And now we see and Sydney assuming acting Sydney emotionally. Didn't know. Hmm. Right. And Sid, what I was saying was just that, and she was being emotional and didn't think that Sydney knew what he was doing or talking about and assumed it was just prejudice because that's what she was led to believe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she, when they have the conversation in the, um, carriage, and I can't remember if it's right before this or or right after this, I think it's before this, when she had, when he says that you've accused me of being prejudiced, but are you really that naive that you don't know that if they marry, then all that money becomes his? And, and she was really naive. She had no idea. Mm -hmm. That was right before they went to um, Sons of Africa. Right. Because in this instance, when they get back in the carriage, they're talking about Georgiana's happiness. Right. And that's when she calls him out, an outlier and he, she'd rather be naive than insensitive of feeling. Right. That's right. Because she, yeah, that's a, and it really hits him hard. Mm -hmm. He says that. The first conversation they have in the carriage when they are headed or when he thinks he's going to bring her to Tom is when they're sitting right next to each other, by the way, which wouldn't have happened, but they're sitting right next to each other on the same side of the bench. And um, he says something along the lines of, um, do, you, do you not yet believe who he is? And she starts telling him that, um, you know, she made a mistake and he, how can you think that he has done this? And he says, are you really that naive? Where do you think that her money all goes when he marries her? And then she says, aren't we just wasting time? <laughs> like she doesn't, mm -hmm. she can't answer that question. The second time they get in the carriage right after they, um, they realize, okay, they're going to go to the boarding house that Beecroft owns. And they start talking about feelings and they start talking about emotions. And she says, all I ever cared, cared about was Georgiana's happiness. What do you think I cared about? Mm -hmm. And she says, that's anyone's guest. You make pains to be unknowable and you're, you're right. an outlier and you're, you fight to not be known. And then when he starts telling her how Otis is an inveterate gambler, she says he's a good man who has made one mistake, just as I have. He had no more intention of doing that to her than I did. And he says, and yet you still did. Yep. And then her, yep. her conversation then flows into um, when he calls her naive and she says, well, I'd rather be naive then it's sensible feeling. And he says, and this, it makes me so sad to look on his face. He looks out the window for a minute and he says, is that really what you think of me? 
And then I'm sorry he said, you feel that way. Yeah. Exactly. If only that were yeah. true, my life would have been so much easier. Right. And he just stares right. out the window. Oh, it just and it, it hit her too when he says that. And oh, yeah. Like the expression on her face. Yeah, very much. And um, we love him for that scene. Mm -hmm. You know, we love the actor who portrayed that so beautifully. Yeah. I mean, they both did, but especially he goes through a big range of emotions. Yeah. She's mostly just angry and worried. <laughs> yeah. And a little afraid. Yeah. But yeah, he, Theo does it really, really, again, he does a really good job with that. And he does a really great job of showing a vulnerable moment, but still being guarded at the same time, because that's what he's yeah. doing. Makes you wonder what he's like in real life. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> he's really good at this, <laughs> but he, you know, he allows you to see that, mm -hmm. which is what makes him such a great actor. Yeah, exactly. And so they get to uh, the, the boarding house, <laughs> which is a boarding house. Yeah. Which is an interesting name for that establishment. <laughs> yeah. And she goes to get out of the car and he says, uh uh, under no circumstances are you leaving this carriage. Uh uh, get in, get back in there. And I love the look on his face when he goes in there to talk to, um, I mean, we're skipping a part that we have to go back to, but I right. just love the look on his face when he goes in there and he's talking to, I cannot even remember the lady's name. And then he hears Charlotte's voice and he stops talking. He's like, what are you doing in here? I don't, of course she came in. When has your word ever meant anything to her? What has she ever listened to something you told her to do? Especially right. when you expressly forbid something. Especially when, and she brings, he brings that up again when they're at the ball, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. But the scene we're missing is when um, B. Croft's man brings in Georgiana to that establishment and there right. is uh, what is his what is his name howard or the his, his yeah man. howard howard yeah mr howard and it's interesting because they did play it differently in the film than they did in the book mm. in the book he's sitting she they're sitting down all three of them and they're having tea and she of course is very put off by the whole thing but well he wasn't so, but it was good the way they did it because it was so you could see how menacing it was mm -hmm. with that man holding on to her. And, you know, yeah, it, it gets a message across very visually. Yeah. And I think I'd much rather like this version than having tea. Tea would be too normal. And this is right. not, this is not a normal situation. This is a very, no. it is menacing, but it is also a situation where there's an opportunity for really, really great harm on all parts oh yeah and you can even hear that in their conversation in the carriage but the way he says um that he's broken horses before and he imagines a wife will be no different like right yikes yeah. very <laughs> foreboding yeah and the look on her face after she says um remember the name all this Molyneux because when he hears of this he'll kill you and he says I'm not really afraid of that since it's him that sold you. So right. yeah, her face instantly crestfallen. Instantly, yeah. It's, she doesn't want to believe it, but you could tell that it offered a pretty tidy explanation for why she was in the position she was in just then. And totally, totally took the wind out of her sails. Mm -hmm. And I think that she connected those dots that you picked me up from the place. I told Otis to meet me. And to her, she, like Charlotte, had probably thought originally, you know, Otis got all those messages. He knew mm -hmm. I was going to be here. And so it just, right. All, yeah, you're right. All of her fight went out in that moment. Yeah. At least till they're in the carriage. <laughs> even, I don't know, her fight has even gone then. She says some things, but still, she's it's not the same. No, yeah. she's, she's despondent in the carriage. Right. Because at this point, she still thinks somebody's going to rescue her. Yeah, she did until and, he said that. Yeah. And then in the carriage, when they're together, she doesn't act like she thinks she's going to be no. rescued because she doesn't give Sydney any credit whatsoever. And she doesn't think Sydney or even Charlotte would be fighting to get her back. Right. Otis would have been the only person who cared enough to see her home safe. She really gave him way too much credit. Mm -hmm. Way too much. 
Yeah. And so when they go into that, that boarding house, going forward again to that scene. And again, it's another situation where Sydney starts talking to this woman. But when Charlotte appears, she takes over and Sydney just observes again. Mm-hmm. And it's in those moments of observation that Sydney is able to pick up on things that he needs to know. Right. And he realizes from the look that woman gives him mm-hmm. that she does know something. Whereas if Charlotte hadn't walked in, she probably, he probably would have believed whatever she said. Yeah. Because I think there wouldn't have been as much of a shock value of this girl to come in here and just say Georgiana like that. Yeah. And I loved, he, she says, have you made an honest woman, uh, <laughs> honest man of our uh, Mr. Sydney? Um, gracious no (laughs) i'm i'm georgiana's friend the look on his face when she says that too is kind of like geez (laughs) he almost he rolled his eyes a little bit when she said that yeah yeah but he catches on real fast from her reaction and um, pursues her you know to say she's my guardian you must tell me what you know yeah Mm -hmm. and then as they're leaving and she Charlotte does not let him get off scot-free from knowing this place and she's not stupid. So she understands exactly why that lady is talking to Charlotte the way she does when she first comes in there. And so it's, is this your idea of love, something to be paid for? And Sydney can't even really justify with the response other than that will do. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because he he knows he he doesn't have an excuse. Nope. Nope. I mean, he can't undo his past. Mm-hmm. And what can you say to a woman like Charlotte in defense of that? Right. There isn't one. And he knows that there is none. Yeah. And I like that he tries to say, <laughs> he says something along the lines of, I suppose asking you to stay behind won't do anything, will it? <laughs> she just stares at him. <laughs> yeah. And I've rewatched that scene several times because half the time I think he has a smirk on his face and half the time I don't. So, uh, you know, like, but I'm sure that he, he, it was a very knowing comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he, I think it was kind of a, um, in a a response, it was an indication of how, if you would just listen, sometimes this wouldn't happen, but also giving up her acknowledgement that you haven't listened to me and we found things because you haven't listened to me. I think it was I think there was a both thing that, you know, you have to listen to me, but I'm not mad that you listen to me kind of thing. It is, I know that's yes. complicated the way I'm saying that. It makes sense. No, no, I agree because it's like he's saying, and there's no sense in um, asking you to stay behind, but he's glad because mm-hmm. had she agreed, he wouldn't have any idea where Georgiana yeah, is. Exactly. You know, and I so- think it's also, it also expresses concern that, listen, I understand you're helping. I understand you have help, but I need you to be safe at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when she is that angry at him as she leaves, and then he he's kind of like, oh crap, (laughs) when Mm -hmm. she walks out. And there's no, he's annoyed, but it seems almost like he's a little more worried than he is annoyed at the fact that she's. I think that he's somewhat proud of her, but doesn't want to admit it. I don't know. I feel like because this is where in my head he's a lot like a Darcy where Darcy will do anything to protect Elizabeth Bennett anything doesn't matter what it is he'll do what he can and I feel that way with with Sydney for Charlotte like he will do anything to protect her because he's starting to give into this feeling he has for a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and I feel like in that moment there's just going off the expression on his face he is a little bit worried for her safety because he knows what he's going to do now he knows he's going to go chase down this, this guy. He knows that this dude likely has a gun on him, or at least his man has a gun because he's not a savory character. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think that um, his, he has a little bit of anxiety about her coming with because of that. Yeah, I think you're right. But I think on the other hand, he's realizing mm-hmm. more fully how much he underestimated her. So there's yeah. a part of him that is just proud of how mm-hmm. much she has helped with this oh i'd agree with that yeah so the next scene i think we go to the denims again don't we i think we do yeah, yeah. the i don't remember right offhand let's see 
Um, Cause one of the lines we missed was where she says, um, well, he can't get, she, she can't get married without your permission. And he says, oh yeah, they don't, they won't, she can't across the border in Scotland. They won't hold that up at all. You know, yeah. they won't honor it. Um, let's see. That was when they were um, confronting, when he was confronting Otis or right after. He right. Yeah. Him. That's a while back. Yeah. Um, so we'll go back to the Denim house. It's the next day and edward is he wakes esther up with the closing of the door and esther wakes up and says edward tell me you haven't been searching all night long right he's like well i'm not gonna rest until i find the document and she wants to help him and he i can't figure out why exactly he won't let her help that's one thing i'm, I'm not really sure where his ink because edward always has an angle so i'm i'm that was one angle i haven't been able to be precise about he does say Go and tell the town about our aunt. They want to know how she is. Spread the news. But maybe because she he wants to be to be the one to find it and mm -hmm. find out what it says. So he doesn't have to tell her exactly suppose what it that says. makes sense. Yeah. Because yeah. then he can tell her anything. He can destroy it, right. tell her it says whatever he wants it to say. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And he says, Go, yeah, go and spread the word. Now, one of the things that a scene that happens in the book that doesn't happen, and this is one I'm curious to know if they shot. So, in the book, just a little bit before this, uh, Mary and uh, Arthur show up to visit Mary and to find out how she's doing, because obviously, word has spread that Sydney and Charlotte have both gone to London. Mm -hmm. And they're comforting her and then uh, then there's a break and then a little bit later um more people including esther especially shows up at mary's to tell them what's going on with lady denim mm. and that so i'm curious to know if they really shot those scenes or not because you know we have other scenes we know they shot that have like the shot the, this is the same time period when um stringer goes to visit mary to apologize oh yeah and then also voices his concern for charlotte but his confidence in her, her ability mm -hmm. so yeah that that scene they shot it just was left out of the movie because they of the show because they didn't have enough time mm -hmm. for it but yeah. it's it's interesting that reminds me of another scene that we skipped uh, where tom is writing to mary oh right right and tom yeah. is it's from his london house and he's writing her saying how he's going to rectify it or he has to rectify it. and i can't remember the word he scratches out and he puts rectify in um i think he puts rectify in. yeah correct or i can't remember either but you see but... mary in her nightdress looking out the window despondently or angrily and then you, <laughs> thomas writing i don't know i just called him thomas that was weird and then you see Tom writing to her and saying all these out these promises. And you could tell the reason he's being careful about his wording is because she says to him in the last episode, no more promises, Tom. All you ever do is break them. So he right. knows his word is crap for his wife right now. So he's right. trying to use the right words that don't indicate a promise, but indicate action. And all of this while he sits in his house, not acting. <laughs> right. You right. Just go do something. Just go right. do something. Yeah. Tom. We, we find out later that he had evidently been knocking on doors, but without success mm -hmm. in London. But so we're so until we're, now we're on the chase scene, right? Yes. Which Where again, Theo James makes out like a bandit. <laughs> <laughs> Another little scene. superhero scene. Yep, that's right. Yeah. And I've watched it several times. I'm sure he did that stunt himself mm -hmm. well he does the one in diversion himself and he jumps across the train tracks yep and that's exactly that reminded me of because he's jumping no, that's the... right that's in front of a green screen but none well yes but yeah. he still made that jump he did his own stunts yeah mm -hmm. in in yeah, they, i don't think they'd actually make him jump in front of a train <laughs> but no <laughs> the length is the same he still does that length of a jump. So I know, which is amazingly far. Mm -hmm. And these characters are one, they're both moving, and two, they aren't that close together. Like you'd think mm -hmm. you could just scoot your horses over just a little bit more. 
<laughs> yeah. He makes the the one thing I will say though is that the carriage driver um of the other carriage, not not Sydney's carriage, he looks so awkward. <laughs> like the whole time. And I think because they were actors who didn't have any speaking parts and they couldn't have spoke. And because I'm pretty sure if you have speaking parts, you get paid more. Oh yeah. And so they very, very clearly and very, very almost pointedly didn't speak. And so it was just, it was odd to watch them interact. And so as Theo James was yelling for him to pull over, to pull over, to stop the carriage. And then he jumps over there. I thought at first he elbowed him in the face, but he just elbowed him a little bit in the chest (laughs) and took the reins. But yeah i mean he yeah yeah and i the reason i thought i used to think he hit him in the face until like the third time i watched it is because it looked like he knocked him out because that's what it's supposed to look like that yeah he knocked him out yeah he definitely hit him right here right yeah. In right yeah but which still and we know it stopped about that far from actually hitting him mm-hmm. yeah which is amazing more amazing than if you hit him if you ask me <laughs> So Theo make, or Sydney makes the jump. Sydney saves the day. He stops the carriage and his carriage driver wisely pulls over in front of the other carriage because he's no dummy. Right. And I yeah. like that when you open the carriage, one, you can see Howard's man go out the other door at right. the same time that Sydney opens that door to take Georgiana out. And he says, we have nothing worth stealing. And that right there should have been an indication to Georgiana of how Sydney felt about her because he says, I beg to differ you right. do have something worth stealing and i don't right. georgiana just she cannot hear anything sydney says with any sort of merit or good intent i hope i one thing i hope that comes up in uh the second season is her reflection mm-hmm. on those events in a more positive way me too in a more adult way because we certainly don't even get that in the next episode nope and we're not going to discuss that yet, but she's, it just doesn't change in the next episode at all. Nope. <sighs> so, and then that's when, because when they're in the carriage at first and he says, you know, I have faith that in time you'll look at me with affection. Right. Like, why? What, what makes <laughs> you feel that way, man? <laughs> you and stole this says- woman, forcibly threatened her in every way. And you expect her to feel affection towards you. Go ahead. You can say what she says. She says, I'd sooner cut my own throat. And he says, well, it's a pretty throat. That would be a shame. But wait till we're married. You know, it's like, uh, obviously, all he cares about is her money. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is meaningless to him. Yeah. Like, hey, I'd like to have a pretty wife, but yeah, it's okay if I don't. (laughs) Yeah. It's amazing how many people walked around and talked about the value of other people, isn't it? Yeah. In that time period, you know, not that it doesn't come up in our day and age, but not the average person isn't talking about how much money, because they don't really know how much money somebody else has unless they're part of a big company or something. Yeah. But weird. And I think here is where, you know, Georgiana always used to say things like that. She used to say things that were shocking to Sydney to just to get him mad because she knew that there was, and we talked about this on an earlier episode, there was typically when she said certain things to Sydney, she knew he wasn't going to let her do it. She knew that nothing was going to come of it other than she was just going to irritate him. And then when she did it to this guy to try to push his buttons to try to get some of her feeling back, it was, I really don't care. (laughs) And there was almost no emotional reaction whatsoever. And then she just, everything in her just sort of crumbles. Yeah. And she had already sort of given up, but that was, I think, a last ditch effort to show some defiance Mm -hmm. that wasn't received and wasn't cared for at all. And I just, it's such a sad scene to see Georgiana look like that. Yes, definitely. You can see why later um, Sydney says, I'm afraid his, her spirit's broken or came very close to it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And then when he pulls open that carriage door and he says, I beg to differ. She, he says, uh, Howard says something along the lines of give me, that's not your property or that's my property or something like that. She says, I'm no man's property. Certainly not yours. She got, as soon as Sydney appeared, she got her fight back. And even that doesn't help her to change Sydney's, how she views Sydney. Doesn't seem like it anyway. 
I mean, he he's yeah. the one who rescued you and he's the one who basically gave you your voice back because you were despondent until he opened that carriage door. And right. then when he's the one who physically lifted you out of there and brought you to safety, you got your voice back and you were able to throw some of yourself back at this guy. You still can't find it in you to see something decent in what he did. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was... Uh... I don't remember exactly, but when you get around to reading the book, they do have a conversation uh, on the in the carriage on the way back to London. So, um, but it's not very long, or you know, but it made me feel a little bit better. About well, see, that. now I think that that's a necessity that I have to read <laughs> 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 because I struggle with her view, especially after all this. I really, really struggle with Georgiana because of her view of Sydney. Right. And it's not that, oh, our hero, you have to fawn over him. That's not what it is. It's he's actually a good, noble, decent guy who actually cares about you. And you are just, you're so cruel to him. That's what I don't like. And she's even that way to Charlotte a little bit. And I don't like it. No, I agree. She, there's a lot of ingratitude there. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, she brought him. He, I'm sorry, he brought her to London and away from Antigua, but she knows darn well that was her father's yeah. doing. And to hold Sydney responsible is not really appropriate. No. But yeah, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see what her situation is in episode and season two. I agree, yeah. So she runs and hugs Charlotte and then the Howard's man comes around and Theo, Sydney, <laughs> jeez, Sydney, threatens him with uh, the punishment of hanging for kidnapping. And right. says, you know, I don't think that's what you want to go for. So out of my way, peasant. <laughs> Shoves yeah. him away in there, on their way back to London. And I would really like to know what the conversation they had in the carriage is now. <laughs> it, I can't remember. I mean, I can look for it, but no. that will be a, uh, that will I be need a little. to buy the book, Janice. You got yes, to set up to buy the book. And it's not that hard to buy. No, I actually looked at it and I don't remember why I didn't put it in my Amazon cart. I don't, I think I was unsure if it was the right one. I don't know. I'll have to, I'm going to look at it tonight. As soon as we're done, Ouch. as soon as we're done, I'm going to look for it. I've said that before. I know I have, but I'm actually going to do it this time. So write me if you are confused about which one it is. Okay. I'll send you pictures. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so at some point in here, we go back to Denim House when. Mm -hmm. You know, she finds Clara holds up and says, you looking for this. Right. And she finds the the will mm -hmm. and they it, the will is absurd. <laughs> I mean, it really is. She can do whatever she wants with her money, but that's an absurd will. Doesn't she say that part of her money was going to go towards building a statue for the donkeys? Uh, a stud. No, it was a uh, what did they call us like? In dogs, you know, you have a stud book it was that kind of thing for the donkeys. It wasn't a statue. Oh, I thought he said the word statue. Is that not what he said? No, I'm trying to find it real quick. Um, but regardless, it still would have put been put money into the donkeys, which obviously she had a lot of interest in. <laughs> she really did believe in them. And it's so bizarre because you don't see a single donkey in all of Sanditon. I know. I know. <laughs> Where Isn't are all these donkeys strange? that she has? Why didn't they, yeah, why didn't they um, do that? I don't understand that. <laughs> you know, I really don't. Because that seemed to come out of nowhere. Like Lady Denham's fondness for her donkey milk. That came out of nowhere. This, this is exactly what it said in the will. I, Lady Denham, being a full age and sound mind, shall impart and bequeath the entirety of my fortune to be left for the development of Sanditon Town and the foundation of a donkey stud in my name. Oh. So that's not a statue. I thought he said a donkey statue in my name. That's why this whole time I've been like, wow, that is really dumb. <laughs> okay. Nope. So... Is that like a male, a stud would be like a male donkey then? Yes. She yes. wants to buy a male donkey and have it be put in her name? She wants, yes. Well, so she would get credit for all the 
pro all the animals that were produced by this stud donkey. What a weird thing to want after your death. <laughs> yep. Yep. Really strange, but that's why, you know, we like how absurd it is, you know, it's, yeah. I wonder if, because she had already basically promised Tom that she would be the lead investor for the town, right? She was as passionate about Sanderson as Tom was. And then we see in episode five, right before she got sick, when she's beseeching Esther, listen, you cannot do this without a dowry. You have to have money. I wonder if she did that because she knew that in her will, she had to put a lot of her money to go towards the building of Sanderson town. She, well, I think she knew that she didn't, wasn't leaving anything to them. Yeah. But I, I wonder how much of that is because she had, because she, of the terms of her and Tom, if she had to leave a certain amount to Sanditon based off of what she agreed to invest. Well, I think she had already given him money. Yes, but not everything that she agreed to invest, though. She Maybe was going not. to be a continued investor. Right. So I don't know. It's impossible because the purchase of a donkey one. can't, if it's just the purchase of a donkey stud, if it's just one male donkey, that's not a lot of money. And she oh. has a vast fortune, and the rest of her fortune is going towards building Sanditon. Right. But he, of course, Tom had no, no idea she intended to leave the estate to him. Or mm -hmm. he wouldn't be so worried about her dying. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I, I'm curious if that was Lady Denham's motivation. If, you know, she, obviously she knew that she wasn't going to leave them anything, but the well, way she that had she no... cares for Esther, she could have left her something, but she didn't. Well, and she might have changed her will. I mean, who knows? But she had no intention of dying for a long time. That's true. But I wonder if she is actually not as crazy as she seems. Because <laughs> if she's actually already done her will, has already made it up, has already set the terms, have already notified her solicitor. They all work together to know where this will is. I mean, she, she was aware that she was going to die. But it's entirely possible that she wrote the will when none of them were living with her near her. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean... She could have been childless when she wrote the will. Well, Esther and, and Edward were always there. Because she married into that family. Right. But I don't know exactly where, I mean, he was the holder of the title. Uh, we don't really have a feel for how long they have been adults living in that air, that particular area. Mm -hmm. You get the impression that they had been living somewhere else and then came there. Yeah. And maybe what happened was there, the, I don't know, the mother when died. He inherited or, the title, I would imagine, yeah. is when they came over. And it could be he inherited as a grandchild, not a, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, his own father may not have been married to Lady Denham. It could have been he was he was married to somebody else. His parents died. They're both of their parents because they had remarried. Mm -hmm. I don't think Lady Denham was his stepmother. It was his, he was she was the aunt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she is. But when her husband, who was Edward's uncle, died, they, right. he didn't have any kids, so the title transferred to Edward. But that doesn't mean they were necessarily he's... living right there then. No, but I would imagine that, I mean, typically when you inherited the title, you go back to the estate that holds that title, yeah. which is actually where Lady Denham lives. So no, it's Denham. Oh, place. yeah, because they got Denham Place and they were in Sanderson House. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's possible that um, Lady Denham's husband, who was the uncle, was the wealthier of the brothers. Mm -hmm. and, and his um father you know was not as wealthy yeah was it sounds like his father would have been a second title. son no i would think his if he inherited you don't think he inherited you and think he inherited the title when the uncle died and had no children okay <laughs> we don't know <laughs> well i mean that's that's how it would have passed to him because otherwise it would have lady denham would see lord denham's children and they aren't in there. So I would, I'm imagining that it, because she doesn't make mention of any children and she says she wasn't blessed with children. She said, we weren't blessed. I don't think Lord Denham would have had any other children. If you don't see them mentioned, if they're not fighting for the money, 
Because yeah, you're right. You're right. So he didn't have any kids. He would have been the first son. Edward's dad would have been the second son because the title yeah. went from uncle to, to nephew. So you're anyway, right. no, yeah, you're I, right. You're right. I just, I wonder how much of her fear for Esther was um, really because she felt obligated to give that much money to Sanderson or because it was like, you know, this is where I want to give my money. I think it probably comes from a po- point of she got her own money through marriage. Mm-hmm. And so that's what Esther should be doing. Yeah. Oh, no, I agree with that. But when she, I just think that when she beseeches Esther and she's very, she's very concerned for Esther, it was, it's, there's a very real emotion there. Yeah. So they find this, they read the will, they both decide, Claire and Edward decide it's ridiculous. There's no way. And Edward has a point that um, if the will is destroyed, the money's just going to go to him. If, if she dies intestate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there there's, it's not going to go to Clara. He doesn't have to worry about it. And Edward's like, sweet. This is awesome. <laughs> We're good to go. Um, but Clara's not an idiot. And Clara has survived on much less than that. So she, you know, tells him this is how it's going to be. I can go to her right now with witnesses and it's not going to be this way. Right. There's an indication there. Now I'm not going to go back and forth here. We're just going to finish up the Edward Clara scene because it goes all the way through burning to them on the drawing room floor, but they negotiate to, I mean, he says, I'm going to give you a thousand. That is like nothing <laughs> in that fortune. That's like nothing. That's barely even a hat price. More than she in, than she uh, ended up with, but <laughs> certainly yes, um, more than Edward ended up with from her. Mm-hmm. But they negotiate down to a fifth, mm-hmm. and um, and then they end up burning it together. And she says, "You've just become shockingly wealthy." And then they do disgusting things on Lady Denham's floor. And at the end, we sort of get a glimpse of what she says in the book about how and Esther has a conscience. Don't tell her about this. We kind of get a sense for that when she says, right. And what would Esther think? Yeah. Let's not, we can't tell her about this, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Edward okay. immediately is like, I don't know what you're talking about. And Esther. Well, he actually goes along with her, but. Well, no, at first when she says, and she says, okay, so we've agreed on a fourth. And he's like, no, nope, we agreed on a fifth lady's prerogative. And he says, you've clearly proven that you are no lady. And right. She says, well, what would Esther think? And he stops for a minute. He stands up and he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And Clara says, yes, you do. He's, nope. She's implying that they've had a role in the hay. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, she's implying that, I don't know that she's actually, because I think she knows that Esther wouldn't do that. But I think she's hinting that, you know, hey, I know there's something going on between two. I know that there is a relationship that you want to keep secret. Right. And so she says, don't worry, they worry. I haven't breathed a word to anyone. But what if she did hear about this and goes on to say all this stuff? So I think we do get a sense of Claire really understands Esther better than Edward does. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then she walks out just saying a fifth will suffice or a fourth, a quarter share will suffice mm-hmm. and doesn't wait forever to say anything, but she just knows, all right, I got you. And then walks yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Really curious what that dynamic is going to be returning because both of those yeah. characters are back. Yes. It will be interesting to see what, yeah, it will because be really interesting. Both of them are like cockroaches. They're right. going to survive anything. Yep. And this was their own atomic blast. So I'm, I'm very curious where they're going to go from there. And I, all those, all these Instagram shots that Jack Fox is sharing with the sideburns and with various facial hair and with various costumes, like, oh man, I really want to know where your character has been. Gonna... Yeah. But what's he been doing in London before he obviously comes back? It's going to be really uh, hard to wait. Yeah, it is. All right. So we return back to the London house. And Tom yes. is very excited to see them all. And then he sees their faces and like, oh, wait, this is yeah. what, okay. <laughs> Poor Tom is always blindsided and never ready for real things when they come because he's so singularly focused that he can't imagine anyone else is going through bad times. No, that's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's focused on his need, but, and uh, Sydney just says, well, let's get the ladies upstairs and I'll explain, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, and then they have the conversation where she's, where um, Georgiana says pretty much the same thing that Charlotte had said in the carriage about his heart. <laughs> mm -hmm. He says, I'm not like you. I can't just carterize my heart. You know, and then you do see him say, you can tell from abundance of experience that he's mm -hmm. had, why he says to her, you've got to put him out of your mind. You'll yeah. just, other why you'll go mad. But he does say, I know your world feels undone right now. And he's speaking yes. about himself at the same time. Right. Yeah, that's right. And again, he's showing these really beautiful moments of vulnerability. And he's never really shown a vulnerability to Georgiana before he's never really hid from Georgiana but he's never had to be anyone else for Georgiana because Georgiana only knew him as the wrecked Sydney mm -hmm. so the only time he's he's allowing this vulnerability out because he's finally seeing the sense of everything Charlotte has said everything Charlotte has said has really kind of proven to him the way things need to be but he also is trying to make another effort to be a better guardian to Georgiana even in the midst of how mean she is to him, he's still trying to be a better guardian, regardless of how she feels about him. Right. And he's genuinely giving her advice that he, from experience, has helped him out. And the only way he could survive that kind of heartbreak. Yeah. And so then um, he goes down and tells Tom what's happened. Mm -hmm. And we don't hear all of that explanation, but he really sort of has a heart to heart with Tom. Yeah. And, you know, and, and reveals his own thoughts and feelings and really um, says, how can one, what, what is the exact word? How can one begin to make amends? Exactly. Until they admit, you know, confess what, where you are and, and gets Tom to talk about what's going on with yeah. him. I like that. He's like, isn't that what you're here for Tom? No, no, no. I'm not here for that. I just came to raise yeah. money. Well, Tom. he's trying to be on the surface with, with Sydney and Sydney this time is not going to take it. Mm -hmm. He's, he's going to get the truth out because he's feeling so vulnerable and, you know, yeah. having to deal with the truth in his own life. Mm -hmm. And I like, and this is another masterful, masterful portrayal by Chris Marshall too. And Sydney says, Tom, I was at the cricket. And the look on Chris's face as he, as he goes through the motions with Tom is really, is really well done, I think. And I know I keep talking about the expressions on faces, but I think it's so necessary. And he's just, he's so sheepish for the first time, really, in that moment. And he's so, you almost get the real, instead of just the manic and the desperate, you get a sense of the real fear that Tom has in that moment. Because right. he's he's coming more to the term, especially as he knocks on people's doors and no one's answering and no one's wanting to help. You can he's very, very afraid of the reality of what he's created in Sanditon and the mm -hmm. reality of what he's done with these men in Sanditon. And if he goes back without any solutions, he's he's done. And I, yeah, I think and Chris did a good job of that. I agree. And he really reveals not only um his fear, but the truth mm -hmm. really for the finally first yeah yeah didn't you kind of like want to cheer when he finally said everything instead of pretending like everything wasn't okay yes and it's interesting because in the book um he doesn't confess so readily um sydney kind of draws it out more mm. so um, oh, man i really need to read the book <laughs> yeah yeah it's a little different but but it, I love the way they did it in the film. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was better, but the, in the show, I should say, not film, but the, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I love that scene and I love how he, Sydney again, has a solution, mm -hmm. how they were going to solve all of these problems. Yep. And uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to see that character not be a part of the next series because he's been so central to this, but it'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think it's going to be great. But I like that the one thing that he says is um, that is really, really hit on the way he treats Charlotte for the rest of this episode is when he talks about Mary and he says, one thing I do know is that I would give anything to have a wife like yours. Yep. And Tom is kind of taken aback by that statement because Sydney is seemed by Tom's standards to be so okay being alone. Right. The last decade. And Charlotte has just made Sydney realize how much he wants that partner. And, and think of the effect that um, conversation in relation to the conversation at the beginning of the rowing scene, how related they mm. are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in episode seven, which we'll get to later. But. <laughs> I can't believe we only have two episodes left. I We've already discussed the Clara Edward thing, and that's pretty much as far as it goes for this episode, at least. Um, except for Edward goes back to Esther and she says, um, you've been gone all night. Did you find it? Like, there never was a will. Feeble mind. She must have been crazy, basically. Yeah. And then she says, well, surely that's a good thing. That means that, you know, it's, it goes to us, right? And he says, he doesn't really, he doesn't really say yes to that. He says, you would think so. Yeah. So he's, he's being very evasive and Esther is no dummy. And nope. again, seeing that he had no sense of decency before, and then seeing how he carried on all night, she knows something is off, especially when she says, oh, I hope to never hear about that wretched well of Clara Brereton ever again. And he says, me too, gives her a small peck on the cheek, on the forehead or on the top of her head and then walks away. And the way Esther looks after him, she is very, very, very suspicious of everything that he's just done. And so that's the last that we see of them for this episode. Right. And now Sydney shows up with Otis. Well, first, before that, um, Tom and Charlotte have a conversation. Yeah. And Charlotte's quite upset. This is where we hear all about Miss Eliza Campion, Mrs. Uh Eliza Campion for the first time. Yes. Right. Where we hear that he went off the rails, that Tom had to pay all of his debts, and they were really concerned that Tom was, or that Sydney was not going to make it. They were concerned that Sydney was going to do something really, really horrible. So Tom went in as big brother and took care of everything. And um, then Sydney went to Antigua and he was never the same ever again. So right there is where we get the background story of why Sydney does so much for Tom. And why he holds the world at arm's length, as she says. Mm -hmm. You know, the man he was never quite returned. Yeah. So you'd think that Tom would be a little more aware of what was going on, um, you know, when the whole ball happens. And anyway, I think Tom is more just thinking he's a changed man now. This is just who he is. And because he hasn't been with anybody in 10 years, then he certainly isn't looking now. And he thinks that the only one that he could ever be comfortable with or love again is Eliza, because that's the only one he ever saw him in love with. Yeah. Yep. So then Otis comes back. Right. Charlotte is obviously surprised that he's right. there. She's also delighted that he's there mm-hmm. because I don't think she ever lost faith in Otis. Right. And he's surprised that she's willing to talk to him. Mm-hmm. Rightly so, and, I think. Right. Right. So he goes up and sort of pleads his case with. But Sydney says, I thought they deserved at least, they deserved at least a proper goodbye which is exactly what Charlotte had said to them the last time that he basically ripped them apart. In episode four. Mm -hmm. Yes. So obviously he is listening to what she says, Mm -hmm. even if it doesn't seem apparent at the time. And his whole goal in saying that to her and doing it in that way was to show her that, listen, you have value to me. What you say has value. And I'm, I'm doing this because I see the rightness of who you are. Yes. More so than it is for sure. I think he does do it because he understands the validity of what Charlotte has said to him. And so he wants Georgiana Otis to have that goodbye. But I think he also really, really, it's more about Charlotte than it is about Georgiana Otis almost. So in the book, one of the things that they don't say in the movie, they say in the book is that Otis wrote a letter to uh, Georgiana and Sydney says, I took the liberty of reading it. And I understand now that he really does love her. 
Oh, I'm glad we left that out. Because I'd rather it just be Sydney doing a good thing rather than well, he was still this, doing it. I read your thing. mail, but he made he. It, I mean, he was probably reading it to prevent her from any more heartache, um, being Georgiana. But then when he read it, he realized that he really did need to give them a proper parting. That's mm -hmm. what I think. But anyway, yeah. so Otis does go up there. Do you think he was pleading his case, or do you think he just really wanted her to know that he still loved her, and without any hope? I think he wanted to know that she, that he had no intention of anything like this happening to her mm -hmm. and that he wanted her to believe him, which she doesn't say she does. She doesn't say she doesn't either. She just says, does it matter now? Yeah. No, because obviously she's lost faith. I think she's had to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And he realizes how much he screwed up. Mm -hmm. And I think when he goes up there, I think that, he doesn't exactly like he's it's almost like this hope where nothing's going to come of this. I'm just going to say this and she's going to kick me out. But also there's like this little teeny tiny bit of hope in the back of his head where it's maybe she'll forgive me because when she says, when he says, believe me, I paid for it. She says, we both have. Yes. And then basically walks out everything about him falls, but he comes in dejected. So you think he, there's no way he has any hope. But then after she says that to him and he falls even more, you realize that he did have some sort of hope that she was going to fully forgive him and redeem him. Which obviously he's come face to face with the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he did a horrible thing. And he, yeah. whether or not he expected it to be that way, whether or not he wanted it to turn out that way, he did something that was not a good thing. And he yeah. did end up using her, whether he meant to or not. Right. And then he goes downstairs and Charlotte says, weren't you even going to say anything, say goodbye. And he says, I'd hardly think you'd want to talk to me. Yeah. And she says, um, what about your other debts? And he says, they've all been paid. Um, I've received a kindness I did not deserve. Mm -hmm. And then Sydney comes walking by in the background. Yeah. Yeah, so she obviously puts in two to two together and knows yeah. that he's the one who's paid it. Mm -hmm. So, and then after that, Babington comes over. Right. I love Babington. <laughs> I, just, I just love that man. Mark and Stanley he, does such a good job with him that every time he's on screen, I just want to be like, oh, there's my Babington. And I honestly don't think he'll be back, but I will be, be thrilled if he is. I would be super. I think he might be back for season three for like a cameo, but I don't think he'll come back for any long role, which is a bummer. Right. He better still be alive, though. I'm going to be so mad if they do something to his character. Oh, no, no. I, I, why would they? I mean, because she he's taking care of business and she comes to Sanditon to yes. visit, you know, or she comes to Sanditon to be with Lady Denim while she's pregnant. Or something, something who knows? something but he has to be in the picture still so he comes by he gives them a invitation <laughs> that I mean, tom reads it and his instant reaction is oh it sounds like the entire beaumont will be there right it gives you that indication tom <laughs> <laughs> well what in the and i'm going back to the book because this part i found really interesting and i kind of wish they had included in the it's the only thing i found i really feel this way about but in the book, when she, Bobbington says, and of course you should come to Miss Haywood. And she says, um, well, I, I'm afraid I have nothing to wear that would befit such an occasion. And he says, you needn't worry on that score. My sister Augusta is about your size and she owns acres of silk and organza. She never wears the same thing twice. So now we know where the source of the dress yeah. is. That's you know, true. which, which I'm sure to men was not important, No, but I did wonder where that gold dress came from all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it ultimately comes from. I do love Sydney in this whole scene because he's watching Charlotte from the moment that that invitation gets into Tom's hands. Yep. He watches her the whole time. And then when, when, um, Babington says, you know, and of course, Miss Haywood, you should come too. Sydney, his eyes fly up to Charlotte and he just watches her for a minute, waits. 
And when she says, no, basically she says, no, I can't go. His head kind of looks down for a minute and he's, you could tell he's trying to figure out something to say, but she leaves before he can. And after she walks out of the room and Tom and Babington are like, let's celebrate. Sydney still gives her a look. He turns behind him and gives her a look before he joins them in. So his head is even more full of Charlotte now than it's ever been. Right. Yeah. And that's proven when he goes upstairs and says, Tom wanted me to come up here. Well, he didn't. (laughs) Tom doesn't care if she's there. Come on. Tom sent me. Well, who knows? They may have had a conversation. No. That was the primary reason. No way. I don't buy that for a minute. Tom wouldn't even notice she was there because it's the men who spread the word of the regatta. Yeah. So he goes up there and he said, I do wish there is, I wish that scene was just a little bit different because when he, you know, tells her all these things and he, he's really kind, he's really sweet. And then she says, I must apologize. And he says, I don't accept your apology. She says, why not? (laughs) And his response is, I've underestimated you. I've done you a great disservice. Yes. But I wish he would say something other than I've underestimated you because it's not the first time he said that to her. Mm-hmm. I want there to be more. I want him to give more of himself to her in that moment. It's still a good scene, but I just wish he'd given a little bit more of himself there. Yep. It comes later. It's a yes, but Eliza Campion destroys it from here on out. Every well, moment don't she Don't skip can. ahead. <laughs> So he says the stuff to her, convinces her to go to the party, obviously, because the next scene is her coming down the stairs in the gold dress. Sydney also wearing gold. Hmm. How odd. And there, there is one thing where Tom is in the background of this and he's smiling as he watches them both interact with each other. Tom doesn't interrupt them. He doesn't burst their bubble. He just watches them in the background with a smile on his face. And then when she says, will this not do? And he says, well, it'll do just fine. Very well. So Tom, to not pick up on that had to be pretty intentionally obtuse. Mm -hmm. He's definitely very Mm self-focused. So they go to this glittering event where we thankfully see Crow again. (laughs) Yes. Our comic relief. And I do love the scene where he's like, introduce me to this dashing creature. (laughs) Babington turned to him and says, that's Miss Haywood, you fool. <laughs> I just, I love Babington and Crow so much that I'm really, yep. really going to miss them in the next two seasons. Yep. I agree. <laughs> when he says, oh, I would not have known you. That mask becomes you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Crow, if that is indeed a compliment. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which it's hard to tell. And Babington and Sydney love that about Charlotte that she's very honest and she's smart. And I think that Sydney and Babington are rare men in that time that they prefer women who are smart and funny and witty. Yes. So I agree with that. Tom puts him to work. Crow says, obviously, I'm not here to work. I'm here to make an ass of myself. I'll see you later. (laughs) Goes into the crowd to be insane, Crow. But this is where, again, Sydney says she will Charlotte obviously says you know I don't belong here and Sydney says I don't either it's like you said I'm an outlier and so this whole episode he's basically telling Charlotte all those things you said I'm taking it to heart and I want you to know I'm taking it to heart and I hear you I see you and I agree with you and I want you to know that I'm doing something about it yep yep that's right and then he taught oh, well they have the conversation where she says i don't think i belong here and and he says um you're more than equal to any woman well, here that's when she says i don't understand what they're doing here and he says well they're just waiting the, the whole oh, right. is to be seen then, right and then she you're says right. with your permission i would like to go home and he says my permission when have you ever needed my permission for anything she right. says, I know, I know I'm too opinionated. I'm too headstrong. I'm too, I'm and too he stops accused, her yeah. and he says, no, you're not to anything. You are more than equal to any woman here. Right. Yeah. And I believe he says, don't ever let anyone tell you different. Um, he says, he says something effect of to believe in yourself. You know, the exact wording was, um, 
Now well, let's find it. Anyway, we, we I'm sure all of us know what that <laughs> line is. Um, so Babington comes up and interrupts the moment though. Right. First time I'm mad at Babington. First time. <laughs> First and only time. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think Babington is the only character who don't doubt yourself. That's what don't doubt yourself. That's what it is. Yeah. And so he comes up and he's like, you know, I hate to say it, but the word regatta is falling on deaf ears. And then Tom pulls Sydney away again, manically, Sydney, Sydney, Sydney. Like he says it like four times and waves him over. And then it's the conversation between Babington and Charlotte that makes her realize that she's falling in love with Sydney. And then she, excuses herself, goes to find Lady Susan accidentally. And Susan mm -hmm. tells her all about how much she loves Sydney. And Charlotte is so taken aback by all the things she never noticed that she can't even think straight. So yes. Sydney appears in that room and I love Susan. You must be Sydney, Mr. Sydney Parker. We were just talking about you. Yes. Oh, thanks, Susan. <laughs> of course. Lady Susan never gives Charlotte her title. She just says, no, I'm Susan. No. that's it. I'm just Susan. Yeah. I have no importance in the world. I have no role. And she just set Charlotte at ease. And she's very open and honest with Charlotte. And Charlotte's very open and honest with her. Charlotte shares everything about Georgiana with Susan. Right. Like everything. And so by the time Sydney comes in to ask her her hand, they walk off. Charlotte's so confused. <laughs> she knows that she's having these feelings, but she can't make heads or tails of those feelings. They just feel like a jumbled mess. Mm -hmm. To the point that when they're walking out there, she still says, you know, you don't have to do this. Well, isn't that what you do at dances? Well, yes, but you could, you know, you could ask someone else. I don't want to ask anybody else. <laughs> so right. she still is trying, she's saying things to help herself understand because she's so confused by this but the dance is beautiful they are if you look at them compared to the other partners they're the only ones who are staying their bodies stay close together the whole time right especially at the end when the other partners are spinning their partners around charlotte and sydney do not separate they stay together right. bodily and when eliza appears in the background is when the first time that sydney is smiling and laughing for like the first time in a long time with Charlotte. I mean, there's a reason that Charlotte teases him in episode five of, did I see a smile? Oh, I doubt it. There's yes. a reason that's a joke because that's something Sydney rarely does. He's very guarded. Mm -hmm. He opens up with her in this episode and, and at the dance until he sees Eliza. Mm -hmm. and that just throws him for a loop. Yeah. Thank you, Tom, for pointing that out. That the life is there. Yeah. But that dance is obviously a very, very big deal for the fandom. Mm. Oh, yeah. A very big deal. I personally think it's the best dance I've ever seen in any kind of period drama. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's more than just physically touching. It's It's about the way that they connect emotionally throughout the whole dance. Right. They come together and there's joy, but there's also a fear and there's also a desire there. There's so many different things when they come together. And even when they pull apart and they're dancing apart, they're, they're finding joy in each other still. Right. And Rose and Theo both said that that was their favorite scene to shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see why. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. um, at the end of the dance, obviously, for whatever reason, Sydney looks up and sees Eliza right there. Yeah. And she takes off her mask intentionally. She's waiting for him to look at her, which just annoys the crap out of me. <laughs> yes. And so when Tom asks her for her hand in the dance, now there are two scenes that really, really give me just like a giddy little laughter. And one is in episode one, when Jack Fox is doing the dancing in the ball scene. And he does, there's these weird little things he does with his arms all the time that make me laugh really hard. I don't know why. But it's also this scene when Tom goes to dance with Sid, with Charlotte and he's like, it's just the way like his head and his shoulders bob. It makes me laugh every time I see it. And I love that scene. I don't know why. 
you know that Jack Fox had really badly hurt his ankle. He sprained it, yeah. Yeah, so he may not have been able to move his feet as much as <laughs> as he would have otherwise. There was um, uh, someone sent out a tweet saying, uh, "Was this planned or was this court or was was this spontaneous or choreographed?" And Jack Fox is like, "It's all spontaneity, baby," <laughs> or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Well, especially when he, he and Tom are dancing, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and they're like on. flapping their wings like a bird. So bizarre. Yeah, yeah, and that line dance kind of dance. Yeah. <laughs> It was funny. So it's during Charlotte and Tom's dance when Tom lets her know, you know, isn't it funny? We were just talking about her. Mm -hmm. But poor Charlotte. She and it, it, it completely takes away the victory that she had with Sydney because she is the reason Sydney was feeling free. She is the reason Sydney was happy. Right. But she can no longer think so in the face of who he's talking with now. Yeah, she has to have lost confidence in mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Well, except for that last, very last small bit, the rest of it's my favorite episode. <laughs> Poor Charlotte standing alone because Babington had to take time away. That's where we end the episode, watching him in sadness and almost horror. And the dancers going around. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That was well done too. I love that. Mm -hmm. I, the, the music and the choreography in this whole show are just top notch they're so yep. good i just love it i agree incredible so i think we dug pretty deep into the episode <laughs> you think <laughs> i think we made the episode double what it actually is in length yeah <laughs> we're talking about it so um do you think we have anything else that we missed anything else you want to say no i think we got it so uh for next week it'll yeah. be a character spotlight on tom parker and you can I know that some of you don't like him. <laughs> I know that some of you do like him and we will be debating that. And uh, if Janice would like to be on that one, Janice and I will debate that and discuss that and talk about that. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And we do have one interview on the docket. That's not cast or crew, but um, we are trying to arrange that for you. And I will let you know more about that as I get that scheduled and as that um, information comes up. So remember, if you want to keep in touch with us, you can always email me at the.santonchronicles at gmail.com. And I do read all your emails there. I see them, I get them. So give us feedback there. Let us know what you want to talk about, what you want to see, what maybe you want to have after the recaps are done, what you would like in that place, what you'd like in place of interviews. If you want to be interviewed by us or talk with us on here, please let us know. We'd love to have you on. You can find us on the Sanditon Chronicles Sanditon Family Fan Club on Facebook. That's where we have a lot of uh, character spotlights, posts, a lot of fun stuff in there. And then you can also find us on Twitter under at Sanditon The and on Instagram under the.sanditon.chronicles. So all those ways you can reach out and contact us and stay tuned for next week where we talk all things Tom Parker. <laughs> and that's okay. it. Bye guys. Sounds See you in a week. Good. Bye. All right.